Hey everyone, it's Jim from from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in Tube Lab number 79, we're going to talk a little bit about the Universal Kit Preamp, and we've got lots of new inventory to talk about. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, the Universal 6 or 12 SN7 kit preamp build series is currently being filmed. The build series is the build manual. What I do is I build kit number one, film the build carefully, and that provides a real-time guide to assembling your kit. Neat, huh? Let's see how far we got this week. So, I always like to start with the power supply boards. There's actually a mirror pair of them because this is a dual mono design. So there's going to be two of everything, two power supply boards, two preamp boards. Um, and I've talked at length at what the advantages of those are, but let's just look at the boards. Notice that they're marked A and B. And look at this, you flip it over and side A. Isn't that great? They're dual-sided boards, so one board can do both jobs. My son Charles and partner designed these and he did just a brilliant job. They're just so easy to put together. And let's just take a quick look at them. There's a couple of fuse holders. That protects the circuit on the secondary side of the power transformer. There's a little filter capacitor at the input, four diodes, so that's a full bridge, and that'll give us our rectification. That'll take the AC that comes in here and send DC out, and then there's just a little dropping resistor and a little bleed resistor. And if you're you're interested in uh, the build or the or the kit, there'll be all kinds of links below to the introductory episode one to um, and to the other, in that episode below that, there's links to how to solder, there's links to the other series, the other builds in the series. Lots of fun stuff to watch. <laughs> not, not unless you're building a kit or you're interested in it. Um, Charles and I have to each watch the videos multiple times, and um, there's nothing more boring, let me tell you, than watching your own build again and again. But anyways, it needs to be done. It's great for beginners, and experienced builders will just take the schematic and look, maybe look up some hard spots that they're not 100% sure of, and they'll just zoom through the whole thing, which is fine. Uh, the, the whole build series is meant to guide uh, beginners through, and by the time you build your second kit, you may be zooming through yourself. So, anyways, so we're moving along at a good pace, hopefully in a week, a week and a half, the whole uh, kit number one will be built, filmed, and uploaded. Okay. Oh, and I wanted to talk about... Hang on a second, I got it right here somewhere. We got our first review already for the Universal. Now, the reason why we've got a review that's not from a test builder is because I actually traded the very first prototype to a gentleman a couple of weeks ago for a big pile of tubes and uh, uh, a lot of them were just you know TV tubes and things like that that really have no value and we knew that I, I always when I buy a collection of tubes I just take everything in the hopes that there'll be some weird and interesting stuff in there that we can make use of and maybe learn from some tubes that we've never seen before Charles is really good at digging through those piles and saying Hmm, you know, I think that might be a tube we can use for something. Maybe a kit. Anyways, you always learn something from collections like that. And we'll look at some of the tubes that were in that collection that were good, that were that were worth the trade. So, B wrote a wonderful review, and I'm going to read it out to you. You know I love reviews. My compliments to you and Charles on a fabulous preamp. I hardly know where to start. Everything about this preamp is such a pleasure from the beautiful sound to its looks. The preamp is so well laid out and proportioned, you can tell how much care and thought went into it. The soundstage is impressive, not just the size, 
but the space between the musicians and the realism of it. The artists are more present in the room with you. I forget that I'm listening to speakers. They're not even a thought anymore. I just want to listen to music, one track after another. Wow, <laughs> that's a great review. And he goes on a little bit to talk about uh, how he was using the preamp to drive and integrate it, I believe. And without the preamp, the universal, in front, it just doesn't sound as good anymore. And that is a very common experience. Audiophiles have known since I was a kid, which is going back a long ways, that you can often add a good quality preamp ahead of an integrated amp and improve the sound. It's just a thing. I've talked about this before, so we won't go into too much detail about it. It's not guaranteed. You really have to try it, look for the synergies, see if you do, if you do gain that improvement. But in many cases, you do. Um, okay. Now, a lot of tubes came in, and I should say right off the bat, the there's enough tubes in the store that I was able to make up sets for the R8. They're selling fast, <laughs> um, but I was able to make up sets. So there were there were uh, sets at the time of filming. There's at least one set for the Svetlana Gold, which uses the 6550C. That's the lower powered KT88. Uh, power tube that I like a lot. Um, there's uh, still one uh, of the Platinum Mullards in the store. Uh, they're going fast. I was amazed. I mean, they're not. They're they're the most expensive set I sell. It's the single most expensive thing I sell, and they're selling. Um, and um, and the German Gold. Uh, I've got I got one set left in the store now. And um, we're going to look at the, that in just a minute. We'll get to it. So they're in for the moment, but you know, the, there's such demand for vintage power tubes, they just don't last long. So don't take your time thinking about it. Um, so last week I talked about one of my favorite 6SL7s that I found new old stock, NOS, new in the box, NIB, new in the sleeve. Um, and they're just lovely tubes. These are from the later production period. So 70s into early 80s is when these tubes are made. They're called tall boys. They have big chrome domes. They have that Sylvania warm, rich house sound with good detail. They're just really fabulous tubes. They're not cheap. Anything now that you find testing high, testing balanced, in a box, in a sleeve, those are premium, premium tubes. They're just rare. I just, I mean, I buy a lot of tubes um, in a year, and I don't see these tubes very often. But this week, the older version of this tube came in in quantity, which is really unusual. And they, a lot of them came in in these cones without their boxes. And I'll tell you a little story about what I'm going to do in a minute. Now, this is the, there's a, regular GT version, and then there's a mil-spec version, and I don't even know if there is a difference. In sound, there isn't, but there may be a higher specification of build. I just don't know the answer to that. The tubes are called Jan CHS 6SL7 GTs, but they're also called VT229. Now, VT presumably stands for vacuum tube. I actually use the same designation in my inventory number so that I don't mix the number up with a tube number. So all my inventory numbers start with VT. They probably did the same thing at Sylvania. 229 is just Sylvania's mil-spec designator, their own in-house designator for the mil-spec 6SL7. That's all it is. It doesn't mean it's a special, special tube. It just that's all it is, is an in-house number that they used. These are very similar sounding to the newer version. And there's a, there are, there, this is a long production run tube. They all sound roughly the same. There are differences. Um, but this is sort of the beginning and this is sort of the end. Um, and these tubes with the bottom foil and the waste chrome are easy to recognize with the elevated plates. 
the used version of this tube is prone to being noisy. Um, so I, it's a, the used version is expensive because I lose a lot in testing. By the time I deliver them to customers, they tend to be fine. The new old stock or close to new old stock tend to be much, much better. So I suspect that it's actually not the tube's construction that's at fault or even how old. These are 70 year old tubes or even more. 1940, 60, they could be as old as 80 years old. 70 to 80, let's say. Um, I suspect it's just how they were used in circuit. And uh, and that happens with a lot of high gain older tubes. The Melts 6SL7 suffer the same problems as the Sylvanias. So it could just be that they were damaged or worn out in, in use. Now, my rule, generally speaking, is if a tube doesn't have an an intact box, even if it's a ratty box, but if it doesn't have its box, it's a used tube. I have exceptions. If a tube is bulk packed, obviously there were never a box. <laughs> so um, so it's still new old stock. Um, new in the crate, NIC? I don't know. Anyways, all these acronyms. Um, a lot of Russian tubes don't get boxed, period, ever. Uh, they just didn't do a lot of boxing. There are some. Um, and when they did do boxing with vintage tubes that are 60 and 70 and 80 years old, the boxes are almost all gone. <laughs> so with the Russian tubes, I look at them, I test them, I decide whether or not they're new old stock or not on their testing numbers and their visuals. With these tubes, I'm going to call them used. And there's quite a few of them in the store. Um, uh, and if you want to know whether it's new old stock or really close, Look at the print and look at the pins. Let me see if I can get that in high def for you. See how clean the pins and base are? That's probably a new tube. Probably. But it'll be sold as a used tube. And if I have enough cones left, maybe you'll get a cone. I don't know. <laughs> okay. And here's the new box for this tube here. Huge difference. I wish I had actually a vintage box handy. I do, but I'd have to go digging for it. So let's keep moving. This is the later mil spec version of this mil spec tube. Another 6SL7. These are very high gain tubes, way over spec, 20-25% uh, over spec. And it's one of the reasons why my testing numbers are so wide. So a good one of these can test 80-80 is 100% for this tube. Same with this one. This one, 100% is 100. If, if that's not confusing, and they can go all the way up to 120, 125%. They're way over spec. They're very low noise tubes, but they're very high gain tubes, over spec. So if you have a higher testing tube, higher gain, a higher GM, mutual conductance, of let's say 20%, the noise floor automatically goes up 20%. That's just how it works. It's very linear, but your volume knob doesn't go up as much as it used to. <laughs> so if you, you know, if you're trying to compare your noise floor from tube to tube, you have to set your base volume at the right level. So you probably would turn it down substantially for this, in which case you probably wouldn't hear any noise, but you'd have to turn it up if you swap tubes. Anyways, so a number of these came into the store as well, and the, these, anything, any of these Sylvania tubes, the 6SL, the 6SN7, they're high demand tubes. They just keep selling and selling. People love the Sylvania sound. I love it. Okay, here's an E80CC that's really special. It came in its box, in a white box. This, I think, is the later version box. Uh, Phillips made a fabulous made fabulous small signal tubes like this dual triode. This is the tube that I use in the E80CC kit preamp. It's got an incredible amount of gain. It's, it's like a super duper 12AU7. <laughs> and the 12AU7 is one of my least favorite common tubes. So it's great that there's a high, a high test version of it. These have gold pins. That's the SQ or special quality. And of course they've got factory codes etched in here. You'll see an upright triangle. That's Heerland, Holland. That's where they were all made. And 
here's the standard box. Some of the SQ tubes show up in the old-fashioned standard box and some will show up in this really beautiful box. I think it's just a time period. They were probably getting, you know, a lot of people were interested in SQ and they were branding it more heavily. Anyways, I like both boxes. And a whole bunch of these Bugle Boys came in. This is the ECC 88, otherwise known as the 6DJ8. Bugle Boys are so named because of the cartoon character on the label here. And I don't know if you can see it, but it's a tube playing a bugle. And most of these have worn off. It's really quite rare to have the print intact. And Amperex was the North American brand name that Philips used to sell tubes. So that it's just all branding. So it's the same exact tube. If we look at the base here, you'll see that we've got factory codes and we've got an upright triangle. So this is also a Heerlin factory tube. And these are great tubes. They're also a high demand tube. Um, and there's quite a few of them. So they'll be tested and in the store sometime this weekend, hopefully. And a bunch of the higher spec 6922s, which is, which is, these are rare. Um, people love the 6922. Uh, this is the Sylvania version. It's the light green print, which makes it probably late 70s. And if you look closely, you can see how solid the construction of these tubes is. They've got a shield down the middle, and they've got a shield on the top. A lot of these ended up in oscilloscopes, and if you're going to have a tube scope, you needed a low noise, you know, tube with really high specs electrically. So that's where a lot of the 6922s ended up. And these may well be pulls from electronic equipment. Okay, we were talking about power tubes and a small bunch of these Siemens branded RFT. Siemens often used the RFT as their own tube. That's how good they were. RFT was the East German EL34. And if you want to figure out if you've got a real RFT, the vast majority of them have this bump where the pin goes into the base. The older version has a really nasty looking flat black base with, you know, straight entrance, no bump. I've only seen a few of those. They're probably only from the very first production years. Now here's something interesting to look at. You see how it looks like we've got smoke where the vent holes are on the plate? And we've even got some sort of residual gathering up here. What that is, I believe, is an over-exuberant application of the gathering material. And it's actually flashed off here, and it's flashed off through these holes. Same over here. That's not soot or smoke, which can happen, especially in the really hot EL84s. Uh, they all get sooty through here if they're used tubes. So I, I think when this tube was manufactured and the gettering was flashed, they put the tube into an induction oven like this and it just, and the induction oven, it, it's, it sort of works on the same principle as those electric burner plates that are so popular but with chefs these days. Anyways, it, it, that giant magnet thing uh, will create heat really quickly and it melts and flashes off the material, the boron I think it's called, is the metal. And as a result, sometimes you end up with some weird patterns and I think this is an example. The tube is testing beautifully. So it's testing like it's new old stock actually. It doesn't have its box, so again it's going to go into a set in the R8 as a used tube. Um, the most important thing with power tubes is that they, that they test good and that they test matched. Those are the critical things. And I live test power tubes because often, well not often, but every once in a while a tube will die on in the amp in a live test. And I don't want that happening to a customer. 
So I try to kill them myself <laughs> first. <laughs> and by the time they're in the amp and being tested, they've gone through two electrical tests already, two separate tests, two testers, and the, the live test is the third and last test before I ship. Okay, well, if you stuck it out and stayed till the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate, $20 shipping around the world, and if your order is $150 or more, after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Have fun, everyone. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.